Uh, we're going to Revelation chapter 14 again, and I, I'm going to apologize to you in advance. Uh, I'm probably going to take another five to eight minutes tonight. Maybe I might actually get ten more minutes. I'm not asking for it. I'm just going to take it uh, because I've got a whole lot here to cover, and I want to finish this chapter, and we'll start in chapter 15. Now, I don't know. Chapter 15 is looking pretty good. We may not get through chapter 15 in our next session, but chances are I'm going to try to cover all of chapter 15 in our next session, which will be a week from Wednesday. Uh, chapter 14, we're beginning in verse number 13. This is part 29. John said, And I heard a voice from heaven saying unto me, Write, Blessed are the dead which die in the Lord from henceforth. Yea, saith the Spirit, that they may rest from their labors, and their works do follow them. Notice here, first of all, that the voice said to John, Right blessed are the dead. This is the second of what's been called the seven Beatitudes of the book of Revelation. Now, I don't want to read all the verses that go with this, but I do want to read the portion of this. Uh, the first one is, Blessed is he that readeth, Revelation chapter 1 and verse 3. Number two, blessed are the dead which die, Revelation 14, 13. Then blessed is he that watcheth, Revelation 16, 15. Blessed are they which are called, Revelation 19 and 9. Blessed is the holy, blessed and holy is he that hath part, Revelation chapter 20 and verse 6. Blessed is he that keepeth the sayings, Revelation 22 and 7. And blessed are they that do his commandments, Revelation 22 and 14. And yet this second beatitude is very interesting here because it pronounces a blessing upon those that die during this time, this dark time of the tribulation. Usually we think of people wanting to live. And they do whatever is necessary to survive. But this, in this case, it's going to be a blessing from the Lord to die which of course helps to emphasize again how dark and dreadful those days are going to be for those that have to uh, try to endure them on this earth. We also need to point out here that the message here is not just to anyone dying during this time. It's not just going to be a blessing to anyone that dies, but this blessing is only directed to those who die in the Lord. There's going to be many that die during the great tribulation period that are not going to be dying in the Lord. But to die in the Lord is called a blessing here. And I want to also throw in that it doesn't matter who you are, whenever you die, if you die in the Lord, it is a blessing. Right. It's going to be a terrible thing to die when you're not in the Lord. And yet this seems to be a special blessing here given to those who die during this time. And it's going to be because of the tremendous persecution that they're going to face. The darkest three and a half years of human history, the darkest years that have ever been known on the face of planet Earth is going to be upon these people that are going to endure during this time. And for them, blessing is going, uh, death is going to be a blessed relief. It's going to be finally the opportunity to get free from all the misery that's going to be here. Now, people normally are prone to uh, uh, cling to life at any cost. And somebody said they do it because of possessions or because of friends and maybe family ties. And they feel like they've got everything to live for. And, and people that have that kind of a feeling, they do it under any conditions. It's, it's a marvel to think about the man that was trapped in the Utah mountains under a boulder and took out his pocket knife and cut off his own arm. It's hard to imagine that somebody could do that and endure that kind of a torment, the nightmares he must have over that event in his life. And yet when you ask him about it, he says they, in the, all the talk circuits that he's been on, he said it's because he thought of his family. He thought of those that he loved, and it didn't matter if he didn't have an arm. It didn't matter how much difficulty he faced in, in releasing himself from that, uh, that place that he was trapped under. He wanted to get back to his family. And so to those that are dying in this time, during this uh, time in human history, there is uh, nothing on the earth, there is no one on the earth that they consider is being worth living for. We can't even imagine such a world. 
But I can imagine that during this time, during this time, during the tribulation period, that uh, no doubt it's going to be an effort just to keep the body and the mind together. I don't think we can even imagine the amount of fear, the amount of anxiety, the, the, the incredible depression. It's going to be off the charts during this time in human history. People that talk about they're going through a lot of things and they're facing a lot of difficult trials and tests and they wonder if the Lord will ever come. We're a bunch of whiny babies when it comes to some of the things that we go through and we, we look for reasons to, uh, to complain and seek for sympathy. But in this time, you've never known fear and anxiety and depression and panic attacks like they're going to have when they stand on this day and have to look at all the persecutions that are coming against them because the beast has just risen to power. He's demanded that everyone would worship him and receive his mark and it's going to put incredible pressures against those that have heard the warnings of the angels, the two witnesses, the 144,000, those that have found our literature after we're gone, those that realize that they, they, have, they have heard the messages against the empire of the beast and they're going to resist that evil, they're going to be horribly persecuted. It's not just going to be against individuals, it'll be against their families. Now, back to 13, uh, verse 13, the Bible said that they may rest from their labors. That's also a promise of hope given to all of us. One of these days, it's going to be over, and we're going to rest from all of our labors. We're not in this by ourselves. Paul said we are labors together with God. I'm glad we're in this with him. And we're laboring for the kingdom of God. Of God. Paul tells us in 1 Corinthians 15 58 that our labor is not in vain in the Lord. The day of rewards is going to come. We talk a lot about the day of judgment, but the day of rewards is going to come for every child of God as well. And your labor uh, for the Lord, Paul said, it's not unnoticed. God knows everything that you do. In fact, Jesus told us in Matthew 25 and verse number 21, he, uh, uh, he indicated here that our labor here on the earth is directly connected to our service and what our position is going to be on the other side. Some people don't do anything. They sit in pews year after year after year and don't do anything. In fact, there's people all across the church world. They come in late and they leave early. They don't want to be a part of anything. They just want to get just enough of God to just barely get in by the skin of their teeth. Jesus told us in Matthew 25 and 21 when he spoke about the talents that were divided, he said, his Lord said unto him, well done, thou good and faithful servant. Thou hast been faithful over a few things. I will make thee ruler over many things. Enter thou into the joy of thy Lord. I, I, I'm going to tell you just the way that we were raised and, and what we were taught, uh, my mother used to say and our pastor also said it. Whatever you do for God, it doesn't matter if I see it. It doesn't matter if anyone sees what you do. When you do it for God, he kept a record. Somewhere over there, there is a record. Every time you stuck your hand in a commode to pull out something, somebody stuffed in there. Every time you washed a window. Every time you ran a vacuum cleaner. Every time you pulled weeds and got poison ivy. Whatever you've done for God. If you didn't do it for the applause of men, he kept a record of that. And there's going to be rewards on that day. And if you've been faithful over a few things, I'll make you ruler over many things. That's what I want to hear the Lord say. We were also warned in 1 Corinthians 3, verses 14 and 15, that if we're lazy and careless, if we're, if we're careless about our labor for the Lord, we're going to suffer loss and embarrassment on the day of judgment. Paul said, if any man's work abide which he hath built thereupon, he shall receive a reward. If any man's work shall be burned, he shall suffer loss, but he himself shall be saved yet so as by fire. The message is simple here. It's going to be much better to die in the Lord. And then at his coming, you can reign with him for a thousand years. He's talking about those during the tribulation. Or you can reign with the beast for three and a half years. And then you're going to be eternally lost. Verse 13 said, and their works 
do follow them. Now we can look at this statement two ways. It certainly is a comfort to all of us to know that you can live your life in such a way that it is a blessing to others while you live. But also it's great to know that when you die, if you've lived your life as a blessing to others, your life can continue to be a blessing to others when you're gone. And that would certainly apply in this context of the scripture to many of those that died during this dark time of the tribulation because there will no doubt be a lot of brave-hearted people that are going to leave a great impression on the minds of others as they die rather than to bow their knee to the beast and his system. So we could say that the many martyrs during this period of time, they're going to leave a tremendous testimony behind. It's going to be an encouragement to many others that follow them that they can also endure. And then the second thing is, according to Vincent's word studies, the Greek word translated here, follow, it should actually be accompany. And so we could change the wording and read it like this, and their words or their works do follow or accompany them. One translation reads it like this, and their works do follow with them which then suggests that their works go with them into the presence of the Lord. We're not saved by works, but every good deed that we do is recorded. The good works that we do on the earth, they're going to yield us a reward at the end of this race. Of course, we know none of us can take with us houses or lands. You're not going to take families or friends. You're not going to take money or cars. When we leave this world, the only thing you're going to have is your relationship with God and the record of your labors. Your works. The record of your works. That's the one thing you can take with you into the presence of the Lord. You've heard it said before. I've said it here many times. Only what you do for Christ is going to last. Everything else is a waste of time. Well, I did a good job uh, while I was working down at the factory or while I was stocking the produce at the grocery store. I did a great job. That's not going to matter in eternity. You need to keep a good reputation here by doing a good job for those that hire you and pay you a wage. But when you get on the other side, those things are not going to be rewarded over there when you sit on pews of do nothing and do nothing for the Lord. What are you saying, Brother Moses? If you think you're just going to sweep through the gates and you're going to get there on the other side and wipe your brow because you just barely made it you're going to be you're going to be very surprised when we get over there if we've been faithful over a few things he's going to make us ruler over many you're not going to live for 20 years over there you're not going to live for 60 years over there you're not living for a retirement over there you're going to live eternally over there and there's going to be worlds to rule over I want to do what I can down here so I've got something great to do over there Now here in verse 14, we're about to be introduced to three more angels, the grapes of wrath and harvest time. Verse 14 said, And I looked, and behold, a white cloud, and upon the cloud one sat like unto the Son of Man, having on his head a golden crown, and in his hand a sharp sickle. The description of the white cloud here has been widely accepted by most scholars as being a vision of the Lord Jesus Christ himself because the white cloud has already been identified uh, over and over again with Jesus. John already used this analogy in Revelation 1 and 7 when he said, Behold, he cometh with clouds. Even when Jesus spoke about this event in Matthew 24 and 30, he said that they shall see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. So we would agree with scholars that this is a vision of the Lord Jesus because... Number one, the white cloud identifies with him. In fact, it is the fulfillment of the passages of Scripture that relate to his coming again. Number two is the reference to this being the Son of Man is also important because that's a title that was certainly referred to the Lord Jesus Christ nearly a hundred times or more in the Scripture. Also in John chapter 5, verse 22, it said, For the Father judgeth no man, but hath committed all judgment unto the Son. Jesus is the one that's coming back as King of kings and Lord of lords. He's coming back as judge of all the earth. Number three, the white color of the cloud speaks in typology of Jesus Christ, who was pure and holy. 
Number four was the golden crown that was symbolic of him because it speaks of Jesus Christ as King of kings and Lord of lords. He had on his head, the Bible said, a golden crown. This is the vision of the Lord's return when he comes back to this earth at the battle of Armageddon. Also, the next seven verses that we're going to read, they're going to move us, in, move us forward in time to this battle of Armageddon. Jesus is going to come back to the earth with vengeance, the Bible said, and with wrath upon the beast and his empire and also all of those that follow him. And when he does come back to the earth, he's going to establish his kingdom on this earth and there's going to be 1,000 years of peace and glory. What a world that's going to be. John said at that event in Revelation 19, 12, on his head were many crowns. Implying he's not just a king, but he is the king of all kings. He is the Lord of all lords. The man of sin we've already mentioned in our study illegally assumed the authority to reign as king of all the earth. He made his boast in the Jewish temple that he was God. He demanded that all the world worship him as God, but all of that's about to change because the rightful king is going to appear on this earth. He's going to come with power and glory and he's going to take the world that's rightfully his. My pastor's wife used to sing a song years ago. She's already dead and gone, but she used to sing a song years ago, the marketplace is empty. No more traffic in the streets. All the builders' tools are silent. No more time to harvest wheat. Busy housewives cease their labor. In the courtroom, there's no debate. Work on earth is all suspended as the king comes through the gate. All the railroad cars are empty as they rattle down the track. In the newsroom, no one watches as machines type pointless facts. All the planes veer off their courses. No one sits at the controls for the king of all the ages comes to claim eternal souls. Happy faces line the hallways, those whose lives have been redeemed, broken homes that he has mended, those from prison he has freed. Little children of all ages, hand in hand stand all aglow, who were crippled, broken, ruined, now clad in garments white as snow. I can hear the chariots rumble. I can see the marching throngs as the flurry of God's trumpets spell the end of sin and wrong. Regal robes are now unfolding. Heaven's grandstands all in place. Heaven's choir is now assembled as they start to sing amazing grace. Oh, the king is coming. The king is coming. I just heard the trumpet sounding and now his face I see. The king is coming. The king is coming. Praise God, he's coming for me. As a boy, I hear that song and it would send cold chills up and down my spine. I could imagine him coming in our neighborhood being at a standstill. I could imagine as people stared up in the sky and watched the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords returning back to the earth. But today it seems like songs like that don't stir anything in anybody because people are not looking for the return of the Lord. But whether you're looking for it or not, I assure you, the King is coming. He's coming back to this earth one of these days. He's going to set up a kingdom and of that kingdom there's not going to be any end and I want to be with him when he sets up that kingdom. I want to be with him because I was once bound and now I'm free. I was one of those in prison but I've been liberated. I was one of those that had nothing but he gave me his name. He made me royalty through his blood. I'm glad the king is coming and he's coming for me. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And when he does come, he's coming with crowns on his head. Not a crown, but crowns on his head, implying that he is the king of all nations and all peoples. Verse 14 said, his hand, in his hand was a sharp sickle. The word sickle, even in the Bible dictionary, it speaks profoundly of a harvest. The scripture implies that it's harvest time for planet earth. The one that has the sickle in his hand is no doubt the Lord himself. Jesus was the Lord of the harvest in Matthew chapter 9 and verse 38. And he's getting ready to come and harvest the fields. 
Now, the scene here that's described, it seems to be a fulfillment of the prophecy of Joel in Joel chapter 3 and verse 12. Joel said, let the heathen be awakened and come up in the valley of Jehoshaphat. For there will I sit to judge all the heathen round about. Put ye in the sickle, for the harvest is ripe. Come, get ye down, for the press is full. The fats overflow, for their wickedness is great. Two things to look at there. They're going to gather in the valley of Jehoshaphat, or Megiddo, or Armageddon. And then he said in verse 13 that the fats overflow. Some have mistakenly interpreted this passage of scripture as a reference to the rapture. They believe that the Lord is thrusting in his sickle and he's going to gather in the church out of the earth. But this language does not fit. Not one single uh, uh, word of prophecy, language of prophecy in the Bible that was relative to the rapture of the church. This vision here of the sickle is obviously a sense uh, of the judgment of God, the cutting down, the judgment of God against sin and wickedness. And he's not re reaping here the ripe fruit of the vine. Verse 15, we'll clarify that in a moment. Verse 15 said, And another angel came out of the temple crying with a loud voice to him that sat on the cloud, Thrust in thy sickle and reap, for the time is come for thee to reap. For the harvest of the earth is ripe. Again, referring to the words of Joel here, this is almost a direct quote from the reference here in Joel we just mentioned. And it's obvious from the words of the prophet Joel that the harvest that's mentioned here, it's not the rapture of the church, but it's the reaping of the wickedness from the earth. Now let me... Clarify that using another verse of scripture. The prophet Isaiah refers to this same event in his prophecy in Isaiah 63, beginning in verse 1. And he asked a question here. He said, Who is this that cometh from Edom with dyed garments from Basra? Basra was the capital city of Edomia. This is this, uh, who is this that cometh from Edom with dyed garments from Basra? This is uh, this that is glorious in his apparel traveling from the greatness of his strength. And then God answers his question. He said, I that speak in righteousness, mighty to save. Isaiah asked another question. Wherefore art thou red in thine apparel, and thy garments like him that treadeth in the wine fat? God answered the question in verse 3. I have trodden the wine press alone. And of the people there was none with me, for I will tread them in mine anger and trample them in my fury, and their blood shall be sprinkled upon my garments, and I will stain all my raiment, for the day of vengeance is in mine heart, and the year of my redeemed is come. So the reference here is to the reaping of the wicked. This is not the reaping of the church. And since the event here described as the closing hours of man's day, that final hour here in this passage is quickly coming to an end. It would seem now that these three angels are coming in a rapid succession. The time is now out. Now verse 15 again, another came, angel came out of the temple crying with a loud voice to him that sat on the cloud, thrust in thy sickle and reap. For the time is come for thee to reap, for the harvest of the earth is ripe. John said the angel came from the temple. He doesn't specify whether this was the temple that we saw open in heaven in Revelation 11 and 19 or whether it was the one that the beast entered in when he defiled it, uh, when he declared himself to be God, the one that was on the earth. The Bible said, then he cried with a loud voice to him that sat on the cloud. We certainly would not suggest here that this was an angel shouting commands to Jesus. We don't believe that. No angel would ever consider making such commands to the Lord. No, this was in fact meant to be an appeal or even a confident approval from heaven's host. There must be an appalling feeling among the angels as well. I know that we certainly get sick of sin, but the angels are sick of it too, of the sin that dwells upon the earth. And they know that the only solution 
It lies in the hands of the one that has the sharp sickle. And so the appeal here is to thrust in your sickle and reap the harvest. For the wickedness of the world is fully and completely ripe. The sin and the wickedness of our world today, somebody said it couldn't get any worse than this. It will get a lot worse than this. A lot worse than this. In fact, it's going to re reach uh, epidemic proportions by this time in history. The ancient world, someone said, could not even be compared to the conditions of this age that we live in. And that may be true to some degree, but the wickedness of the system of the beast and those that dwell on the earth uh, uh, at that time, it's not even going to compare to what we live in. You think it's hard now, you have no idea what it's going to be like when the church is gone. There has always been sin that has run rampant throughout the human race ever since man was kicked out of the Garden of Eden. And no generation has ever witnessed the conditions uh, of wickedness and evil that the last generation is going to witness. The age-old question that people often ask, in fact, a lot of agnostics ask it when they want to prove that there can't possibly be a God. They want to know again and again, why has wickedness continued? Why has these sinful, evil things taken place? If there is a God, why does it continue from generation to generation? David asked the question, why do the wicked prosper? How come the wicked are not judged? Why are the wicked allowed to continue with all of these evil deeds? And yet it seems as though they're unchallenged by God. But when God made a covenant with Abraham, in Genesis chapter 15, God told Abraham that his seed, they were going to endure many difficult things. And these were going to take place many years into the future. God, in fact, told Abraham his seed would not even possess their own land of promise for some 400 years. God told Abraham that his seed would have to go into Egypt. And then they would come back after 400 years and repossess that land. Why did God delay that many years? Why was the promise 400 years in the future? God told us why it was. People overlook it, but God told us why it was in Genesis 15, 16. He said, for the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet full. Do you realize that God in his mercy and his grace, he gave the Amorites 400 more years to repent, to change their ways, and they wouldn't do it. He's a merciful God. The Amorites were among the many ites that were marked uh, in, in the book of Joshua for extermination in Joshua chapter 3 and verse number 10 when the children of Israel re-entered into that land. They were to exterminate all of the idol worshipers. So we could say with confidence that although the judgment of God has not come yet, that there is still sin and there is sinners all over the world today, uh, they may not be dealt with immediately. They may not be dealt with in your time frame. But I can assure you God's word is true and there will be an end to that sin. Judgment will come to the wickedness of this world. It's going to come exactly like God appointed and not a day before. Verse 16, and he that sat on the cloud thrust in his sickle on the earth and the earth was reaped. We now have in these uh, closing verses of this chapter, we have two scenes here of a sickle or a sharp sickle that's reaping the harvest of the earth. One appears to be done, uh, that it's being done by the Lord himself, as we've seen in the last two verses, and the other seems to be a special angel that's coming forth from before the altar. Now, there are some scholars that suggest these are both referring to the same time period, which is the Battle of Armageddon. There's others also that believe that these are references to two types of harvest, that are going to take place. One is by the Lord, the other by the angels, because the first reference here is to the harvest of the earth. The second one here is to the vintage of the earth. And so some scholars suggest that the reaping of the earth is apparently something different than the gathering of the vine of the earth. Uh, verse 19 uh, tells us, of course, that both of these are done by the great sickle of judgment. It's used in both of these examples. One's going to precede the other. The latter is a reference to the gathering of the armies of the beast. All of his followers, they're going to be gathered together 
to the battle of Armageddon. The first one is reaping the harvest of grain. The second one is the vintage of grapes. There's a difference here because the grain is cut and it's put on a threshing floor. The grapes were gathered and they were placed in a wine press. That's significant because of the scripture we read in Isaiah just a little while ago. Most scholars say the first probably refers to all the worldwide judgments of the second half of the tribulation that will be unleashed when the seven bowls of wrath are poured out over the earth in Revelation chapter 16, which is a judgment that will climax with the utter destruction of Babylon, which was the capital of the entire Babylonish world system. But the second refers more uh, specifically to the final judgment of the beast and his followers that's going to take place at the battle of Armageddon. But keep in mind that it's Jesus that opens the seals of judgment. He's the one that pours out his wrath upon the beast and his system. Now this, import, this is important because the last of those judgments is now about to be poured out as the seven angels with their, their bowls of wrath are ready to pour out the contents upon the beast and those that follow him in Revelation chapter 15, which we're going to get to in our next session. So this is the final and the most horrible judgment upon the beast and his followers that are just prior to the battle of Armageddon because the sharp sickle of Jesus Christ is getting ready at this point to make it sweep through the earth. Jesus brings his wrath and judgment upon the beast and his followers. According to Matthew chapter 13 and verse number 39, he said the harvest is the end of the world and the reapers are the angels. Now verse 17, and another angel came out of the temple which is in heaven, he also having a sharp sickle. Now this is certainly an age of sin and corruption, wickedness. Only the brave uh, that are willing to live for God survive in this day. And it's not going to be any different in that day. Wimpy people are not going to live for God during the tribulation. There's going to be some that are going to refuse to follow the beast even knowing that it will cost them their life. And then when Babylon's judgment is falling upon Babylon, according to Revelation 18 and 4, we hear this, we hear this uh, uh, mercy calling out, come out of her, my people, that you be not partakers or you don't share in the judgment of her sin. Again, we've got the angel coming from the temple, bringing judgment upon the world because the temple was the place of God. It's where God dwelt. It was symbolic. And since the angels were the guardians, so to speak, of the uh, holiness of the temple, of that place, they were involved also in the bringing of judgment to those that brought so much wickedness to the human race. And so verse 18 said, and another angel came out from the altar. We understand where he's at, which had power over fire and cried with a loud voice unto him that had the sharp sickle saying, thrust in thy sharp sickle and gather the clusters of the vine of the earth for her grapes are fully ripe. Now this is significant because this is the sixth angel introduced now in this chapter. He's seen coming from the altar, which is the place of God, which is the place of judgment. Why do we call it the place of judgment? The altar in the Old Testament was considered a place of judgment because the altar was where the sins of the people were brought in the form of an animal to God to be killed, sacrificed, and consumed there. Now, the scripture said of this angel, he had power over fire. We know in chapter 18 that Babylon's going to be burned with tremendous fire. We mentioned several uh, references to fires of judgment uh, in this study. And this may be the same angel. We're not told in the scripture it may be the same angel that brought the fires of judgment in other past uh, lessons that we've studied. Of course, the book of Revelation does give us a glimpse of the responsibilities of some angels, but in this verse, we have some of those spelled out in some more detail. The appeal is made here to the angel with the sharp sickle, the same appeal that was made to the Lord Jesus Christ, to thrust in thy sickle, implying that sin and ungodliness has affected enough people long enough Enough people, uh, their lives have been destroyed by sin. The beast, his system has had their day, and now it's over. It's finished. 
this angel is commanded to thrust in thy sickle, gather the vine of the earth, the grapes are now fully ripe. The time for harvest has come. What's that mean? That means Armageddon is about to begin. Verse 19, And the angel thrust in his sickle into the earth and gathered the vine of the earth and cast it into the great wine press of the wrath of God. That's what Isaiah said. He said they were going to gather in the valley of Jehoshaphat. It's the valley of Megiddo. It's Armageddon. It's also called a bowl, the great bowl. It's considered to be the vine or, or the, the wine press. And he said uh, they're going to be cast into the great wine press of the wrath of God. The harvesting process, it would bring together the grain that was cut by the sickle. The angel would bring the grain of wickedness uh, to the or, or the tares of the earth to the final judgment place to be consumed with fire. Chapter 16, verses uh, 13 and 14 tell us that three unclean spirits are going to go forth to the kings of the earth to gather them together for battle at Armageddon. Of course, we don't know what the politics are going to be that are involved. We don't know what the world leaders are going to be. We don't know how the nations are going to respond. But we do know that at this final showdown... Uh, you could say, well, it's a lot of speculation. But at this final showdown, there's going to be angels, three unclean spirits that are going to go and convince the kings of the earth to meet here in this wine press. We've got passages like Zechariah 14 2, For I will gather all nations against Jerusalem to battle. Joel chapter two, uh, 3 and verse 2 said, I will also gather all nations and will bring them down into the valley of of Jehoshaphat. The wine press is the valley of Jehoshaphat. Jehoshaphat. The place of Armageddon is also called the plains of Megiddo in the scripture. It's going to be the place of the final showdown for all the armies of the earth that are going to gather together in that place. The one that brings victory at that place is none other than the Lord Jesus Christ himself. Revelation chapter 19 verses 1 through 22. Now the last verse in this chapter, I want to spend a little bit of time here. I hurried to get here. But verse 20 said, And the winepress was trodden down without the city, and the blood came out of the winepress even to the horse bridles by the space of a thousand and six hundred furlongs. According to the Bible Encyclopedia, in the Middle Eastern countries, it was the custom to gather the harvest of grapes into a great vat or enclosure. And the people would get in with their bare feet and walk, dance, and sing as they tread upon the grapes, squeezing the juice out into containers. This is the exact picture that has been described for us of the Lord Jesus in Isaiah 63 as he is seen here treading the wine press alone. And he said his garments were stained from the grapes that he treaded Upon Isaiah 34 gives description gives a descriptive view here of the scene that's taken place. As he mentions, he says, "The sword of the Lord is filled with blood, for it is the day of the Lord's vengeance and the year of recompenses for the controversy of Zion." Now I know some folks don't like to talk about any blood, any violence, any of that kind of stuff. I'm going to tell you, Armageddon is not going to be a pretty place. Sin is not pretty, and so to punish sin is not going to be pretty either. It's going to be a very, very violent scene. And it doesn't matter what commentaries you read, what scholars you quote from, there's no way any of us can accurately describe what it's going to be like at that battle that's going to take place. As all the nations of the world are going to come together, meet in that valley, that valley of Armageddon, for one final battle. We don't know how many people are involved. But John does give us here a chilling vision. He describes the sudden spilling of blood of all these unnamed or unnumbered masses, multitudes that are all standing in a great shoulder-to-shoulder -shoulder formation that's extending throughout the entire land of Israel. The bloodshed is so massive and so quick that scholars say the only appropriate comparison is the spurting of the juice from the tremendous cluster of ripened fruit beneath the feet 
of the grape stompers in a wine press. The blood is going to be so sudden. The explosion of blood, the splattering, is like somebody standing in a wine press and stomping fully ripened grapes. The masses of soldiers and civilians, many riding horses, many on foot, many in vehicles of one sort or another, they're all going to be crowded together in that huge vat, that trough, that valley of Megiddo, the valley of Armageddon, the valley of Jehoshaphat, God's great wine press. They're going to be crowded there together, unable to flee, no place to run, and then all of a sudden, they're all going to explode like bursting grapes and blood spills from billions of fountains. This reference to the blood as it came out of the wine press, it was described as being even to the horse's bridles. And it was by the space of 1,600 furlongs. Now that presents some very interesting questions. People have asked the questions and I've asked them too. I remember being just, just getting in the church and the first book I wanted to read was the book of Revelation. I wanted to know how much blood is that? How tall is that? Is this talking about it being that deep that it actually reaches in the valley of Armageddon to the horse's bridle? Does it mean that the blood is so deep that it's going to flow a 1,600 furlongs? You know how far that is? In the Roman measurement, it was 200 miles. In our measurement, it's 180 miles. It's obvious that this, this kind of destruction or carnage is going to be tremendous. In fact, it's going to be so great that God is going to call the vultures of the earth to come there and help clean up the mess. When Ezekiel refers to this battle in Ezekiel 39 and 12, it was going to take, according to him, seven months just to bury the dead. That in itself is mind-boggling. The 1,600 furlongs, that's 607 feet in length. That's 180 miles in our measurement. That's just about the entire length, distance of the entire land of Israel. So it appears here that the entire land will be bathed with the bloods of, blood of Armageddon. If the number gathers there, and I'm closing with this, if the number that gather there for battle is 200 million, which it could possibly be, that's what many scholars suggest, if each one shed all of their blood in one day, at the appearance of Jesus, not going to be a battle there with swords and guns. No, Jesus is going to come from heaven. And there's going to be, like all of the grapes in a wine vat, he's coming to stomp, to destroy. Now, some suggest that this would be 300,000 gallons of blood. Some suggest as high as 200 million gallons of blood but it's also scholars say that they believe that it's the valley it's going to create in this valley a lake that will actually be to the horse's bridle but when you step on grapes the juice all comes through the trough to go into vessels we don't know how many people are going to be gathered there and we don't know what a bloody world uh, or, or, or area that's going to be. But no other battle in human history can compare with the bloodshed that's going to take place at this time. There have been many references in the past. World War I was called the war to end all wars. It did not. World War II was called the war to end all wars. It did not. But this, I can assure you, it will be the final war. It will be the final battle. There's a reference to Satan gathering sinners together to battle in Revelation chapter 20, verse number 8. This is really not a battle per se because the Lord's going to call fire, cause fire to come down from heaven and destroy all of this host. There's no fighting there. How can you fight against God? The one thing that's certain in regards to this battle, the victor is the Lord Jesus Christ, and we're going to come back with him on that day at that battle, when he sets up a kingdom, I want to be with him on that side, not on this side. Amen. There is great hope for the church. We've not even got to the millennial reign yet where we talk about what we're going to be doing and what the Lord's got planned for, uh, for his people. But it's a great, heaven's going to be a great place. 
This world's going to be a terrible place to be. I don't want to be here. I want to be gone when the trumpet of God sounds. I want to be ready for that. And I think that there's some great things in store for us. Once we get past the destruction of the beast and his system, there's some great things in store for the church. Amen. And that's what we're living for. We don't live for God every day. You should not live for God every day with fear. You ought to live for God every day with hope. A thankful heart. Amen. With a thankful heart. There was a lady...